Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Spirit. Our topic is listening to God. And at this point in the series, we're exploring what the New Testament has to say about listening to God. And by the very nature of things, we've talked a great deal about prophecy. And we've seen that the gift of prophecy was established in the early church. It seems that major decisions and major direction was given to the early church through the means of prophecy. But what is prophecy? Prophecy is hearing what God is saying now, what God is saying to us, and then taking that word and passing it on to other people. The gift of prophecy is very important in the early church life. We find that so often God spoke words of encouragement through the gift of prophecy at a congregational level. And we know that this gift of prophecy is very important even until today. We also find that there were prophets, not just people exercising the gift of prophecy, but those who were officially recognized as prophets. We have Agapus, who is a well-known New Testament prophet, the apostles themselves, and, and surely even those who were used by God to write the New Testament, people like the apostle Paul and people like the apostle Peter and other authors of the New Testament, they must be called prophets because they were giving a revelation from the Holy Spirit. The scripture is called a prophecy. The whole of the scripture is a prophetic revelation. Now, the prophecy of Scripture is infallible. In other words, it's not mixed with human thoughts and human ideas. God so moved on these prophetic authors of Scripture so that what they wrote was exactly what God intended them to write. Even though we find human personality coming through and they mention human issues like greetings and farewell and passing on news, Nevertheless, all of these things were exactly what God intended to be written. Now, when we talk about prophecy today, there are different schools of thought. Some people say, now that we have the scripture, prophecy is finished because the prophecy of scripture is full and complete and we don't need to hear God in any other means other than the scriptures. Now, I have a great deal of sympathy with that because I understand the importance of the scripture. However, the New Testament also teaches us that every believer has the Holy Spirit on the inside. And if Holy Spirit is living on the inside of us, He is going to speak to us, speak to us in so many different ways. So we have this living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ by His Holy Spirit. Now, we need to make sure that every prophetic word or every prophetic impression that we receive is judged and tested accurately because it's not enough to say, well, God told me this and this is what I believe the Holy Spirit's saying. We have to examine it and discern correctly. The Bible says, do not despise prophesying, but test all things. So even in the New Testament times, we find that the gift of prophecy, as it was experienced by congregational members, individual believers, that gift had to be tested, and it's so important that we develop discernment alongside listening to God. Some people say, no, 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 prophecy is finished because it says so in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 13, let's read it. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 9, Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. <laughs> but the next verse goes on to say, but when that which is perfect is come, these things which are partial shall be taken away, and, and they will be finished. So some people say, well, now that which is perfect has come. It's the scripture. This is the perfect word of God. Prophecies have ceased. Tongues have ceased. Well, that is not a good interpretation of scripture. Because when it says that which is that when that which is perfect has come, 
it goes on to say, then we shall know even as we, we are known. In other words, we'll come to a perfection of knowledge and a perfection of love, and it relates to the perfection that is yet to come. And in the meantime, we need continually to have the Word of God, the Scripture, in our lives to bring us to perfection, and also we need prophecy to encourage us along the way and to challenge us along the way and to give us the now Word of God and to enable us to listen to the Word of God. And so, prophecy has not ceased. We need it until Jesus returns. And so, that is the teaching, I believe, of the New Testament on the matter. I want to warn you too, however, that you will find that if you want to move in prophetic role and prophetic ministry, you will be opposed. Now, the Old Testament prophets were rejected and persecuted. The New Testament prophets, too, didn't seem to be that easy to get along with. There are times, friends, when, when you speak the Word of God in all humility and in all correctness, nevertheless, you will find that there will be persecution. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, we know that it says that many were killed and will be killed because of the Word and because of the pre prophetic testimony of the Word. And so, we know, friends, that there is extreme opposition to the living Word of God. When you see how powerful a prophetic word is, you can see how the enemy wants to oppose it. Now, let's begin to have a look at how the prophets functioned in the early church. I've already explained to you that in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, God has, well, it's actually the person of Jesus Christ who's done this, but he's done it on behalf of the Father. The Son has selected and chosen people from the body to receive certain gifts. The risen, ascended Christ has distributed gifts amongst the body of Christ, and he has given some apostles. He's given some prophets. He's given some evangelists some pastors and some teachers. Uh, this isn't, doesn't mean to say everybody is an apostle, everybody is a prophet. It doesn't mean to say either that everybody is one of these five things. These five, this fivefold ministry is a leadership function that God gives to those who are separated as a life calling into Christian leadership and ministry. And it is a distinction within the body of Christ because it's these ministries are, that are there to equip the rest of the body of Christ for the work of the ministry. These five ministries are not the ministry of Christ, but these are the ministry gifts of Christ in order to equip the body to do the ministry. So it shows that some are going to be prophets, but not all are going to be prophets. And we see this in the early church. How did the prophets function? First of all, we see that they were not elected by the early church. They were not chosen as elders or by the elders to, to okay, we're going to choose you and we're going to make you a prophet. It doesn't happen that way. It's the work of Jesus Christ. He pours out these gifts. He gives this calling. It's his prerogative. But the leaders and the body of Christ acknowledged those upon whom God's hand rested. So they could see, I can see a prophetic ministry in you. And then there was freedom for that prophetic ministry to function. We find in the lists that are given, prophets usually come second after apostles. I'm not suggesting that this necessarily means some kind of pecking order, some kind of order of priority or order of importance, but it does show us that apostles and prophets together were linked. Ephesians chapter 2.20, it says that the whole church is being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we have the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the apostles and prophets, which clearly means built upon the ministry, men and women with that ministry, okay? And so the apostles and prophets are closely linked. And these two ministries have a foundational role in the history of the Christian church. I want to pause for a moment and just help you to understand that. Because we've got to be very careful before we say that today in the church there are apostles and prophets who function in exactly the same way that Peter functioned 
and Paul functioned, for example. Because these foundational apostles and prophets had a special role to play in the laying of the foundation of the, of the, of the church. And in other words, they were called to receive infallible revelation that would become the Scripture. They were actually the witness that lies behind Scripture. And that is now a finished and completed process. God has completed His Scripture. We don't have a loose-leaf Bible that we add our prophecies on at the end. There are no more doctrines to go into this book. And that's where the major cults go wrong, because they have some so-called apostle, some so-called modern-day prophet, who is speaking extra words into the Bible. But these early apostles and prophets were those whom God used at that time so that we would have the completed scripture. Now, we don't need another word from God to add to this book. So that form of ministry is finished. We turn to the scriptures when we want to hear that kind of ministry, the infallible word of God and the doctrines that have been delivered to the Christian church. But that doesn't mean to say that there is no more room for any kind of prophets and apostles today. It just means that they don't minister under that same infallible foundational anointing that these early apostles and prophets had. Uh, but we'll come to what they do do in a while. But let me put it to you this way. You see, the apostles were called by Jesus to be eyewitnesses of his life and ministry, his death and his resurrection. And so when they were testifying, they were testifying to what they had seen and heard, and we were their testimony. And you remember when Judas had committed suicide, and they said, somebody else, according to Scripture, must now take his, take his place, and they selected Matthias to be this one, and they said, he must have been one who was with us from the baptism of John right the way through to the resurrection. In other words, the role of those early apostles was to be eyewitnesses of Jesus on this earth so that they could tell other people about it. That's why we have the Gospels. So they were apostles in the sense that they were eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry. We are not. We don't qualify. Okay, but they were prophets because they weren't called just to say, well, we were there, we saw him, we heard him. Yes, we can verify that. That was part of it. They were also called to bring an infallible interpretation on those events. So they don't just describe the cross. They proclaim it. They don't just describe Calvary. They also give the revelation of what God was doing. They don't just say, yes, on a certain date, certain time, certain place, Jesus was crucified. They say, he died for your sins, according to the Scriptures. He took your place on the cross. They teach from it. They explain it. And they explain it with prophetic revelation infallibly. So that's why the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The doctrinal foundation, the revelation of the church, the faith that has once been delivered to us by uh, 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 by God, delivered to the saints. The fact that God has spoken fully and finally, completely in His Son, as it is recorded and given to us through this apostolic prophetic ministry here uh, recorded for us in the scriptures. And so you can see now that our job as we move in the prophetic and apostolic ministry today is to build on that foundation and to build strongly on that foundation and so that we can see God's house built in our day and in our generation. And so we see then that there's a unique role that the early apostles and prophets had, but there is also an ongoing role that we need today. Let's have a look at Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Here we see how the prophets functioned. In the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Saul and Barnabas for the work which, to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Here we have a classical way in which the prophetic ministry functioned in the early church. They were ministering to the Lord, and the prophetic word came, and as a result of that, a ministry was activated. And so we see, time and time again, 
that people were activated in their ministry through the prophetic word. 1 Timothy 1 verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made uh, uh, concerning you, you may wage a good warfare. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given by the prophecy, by prophecy with laying on of hands of the eldership. And so the prophets were active in activating ministry. They were active in leadership at the time. In Acts chapter 21, we find the prophet Agapus visited Paul and gave prophetic action and prophetic words concerning what was going to happen. In Acts chapter 11, we find the prophets coming down from Judea, prophesying that there was in Judea. And uh, Agapus this famine, it took place in A.D. 49 to 50, and it swept westwards throughout the Roman Empire. But that insight meant that the church was forewarned. They were able to take offerings and to go and minister to the saints in Jerusalem. And so, Agapus was pointing to what God was doing, and then the elders and the leaders and the believers together acted on that prophetic word. As we look at these examples we see a number of principles that seem to govern the New Testament's handling of prophets. And I've got them for you point by point in your manual. First of all, there was an official role for prophets. Their office was recognized by, by church leaders. When we say office, there's strictly speaking no such word as office in the New Testament. It's describing a function. But they were officially recognized in their function. They weren't given an office with a label in front, say, prophet, and then they had to prophesy. No, they were moving in that prophetic function, and they could see that they had that prophetic gift from God, and then they were recognized. We see that the prophets had a translocal ministry. In other words, they traveled from church to church, and they came from one place to another. And there are prophets who prophesy and operate within the local church, but there are also those who are given as, the, as gifts to the body of Christ at large and can come and minister into the situation of another church. They do that. They don't usurp the authority over the local church leadership. They come in submission to the leadership of the local church. But they do have a valid translocal ministry. They had an inspiration. It was an inspired ministry. They were anointed and inspired by the Holy Spirit. They had a predictive function from time to time. They also had a directive role. At times they directed believers to act in certain ways, not necessarily governing them, but by leading them and pointing them to what God was saying, and then the leadership would come together and say, yes, we hear in this a specific direction from the Lord, because the government belongs to the members of the church, not just to those who travel perhaps, or even just to prophets because they prophesy. Then we also see this had a practical role. Can you imagine what it was like when those believers in the Gentile world took up offerings and came and brought that to the Jewish believers suffering in Jerusalem from the famine, what would that have done to Jew-Gentile relationships at that particular time? That prophetic word brought harmony. It was a practical thing. It had a practical result. And then we see that this had a revelatory function. Prophets, they taught God's word. They spoke God's word. So that is the role of prophets in the early church. Now we're going to come and look at the gift of prophecy as we see it in the New Testament. It's a very significant gift, uh, but it must not be emphasized to the exclusion of other gifts. We see main teaching about this in 1 Corinthians 12 through to 1 Corinthians 14. And it's in the context of the assembly, people gathering together for public worship. It's in the context of assembling together for the Lord's Supper. And so the teaching here is particularly relevant to the use of prophecy in public meetings. And we find the key verb of 1 Corinthians 14 is the word oikodomeo, which is the verb mean to edify. It means to build, to build together in order to build up. And so the purpose of prophecy is to build the body of Christ and to build the church. And anybody who wants to see the body of Christ built and the church edified surely will want a desire to be used for this gift. That's why it says, be zealous for prophet to prophesy. 
the strong word zeleo is, zeleo is, is a word which means to have great zeal, to crave for, to long to... Sp- so we should long to speak to, for God. We should long to make listening our high priority. Now, the characteristic of prophecy is that it is directed towards people. It is God speaking to people. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Now, the words of our t- tongues, when we speak in pray, we pray in tongues, we're addressing it to God. When we pray and worship, we're addressing it to God, and we can be inspired by the Spirit in doing this. Tongues is prophetic speech, but it's directed to the Lord. Worship is prophetic. It should be prophetic anyway, but it's directed to the Lord. But when it comes to prophecy, pure and simple, it is directing, is directed towards people. And so, we need to see that tongues and interpretation can have a functional equivalent to prophecy in that people can be built up and edified when they hear it, but it's still directed to the Lord, whereas prophecy straight goes straight to the heart, straight to the people. It's God directing uh, His word to the people. The purpose of prophecy is to build, to exhort and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. It says there that prophecy is for edification, exhortation and comfort. Now these words are very important. Edification, we've already looked at that. Oikodome, edification. It's a positive gift. It's there to build up, not to tear down. Paraklesis, exhortation. And that's the word that's used of the Holy Spirit. He is the great paraclete. And the word comes from two Greek words, para and kaleo, called alongside. Called alongside to give witness. Called alongside to give strength. Called alongside to give encouragement. And so, when we minister in prophecy, we are coming alongside people. We are not standing over them and imposing God's word on them like some great big pronouncement. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Paramuthia is the verb there, is the word. Comfort. It means near speech. It means speaking near, speaking close to somebody. In other words, when we prophesy, we're drawing close with the Word of God as God has drawn close to us and revealed that Word. And then out of closeness and tenderness and comfort, we release it into the the lives of others. So this shows us that prophecy is there to edify others. It's there for other people. It's not there for yourself. So it's not there to promote yourself or to puff yourself up. And if you move in the gift of prophecy, remember, friends, it's not there to make you prominent. It's not there to make you famous. It's not there to make you rich. It's not there to make you prominent in the body of Christ. It's there to minister to others. Therefore, we can see prophecy is important. It's not everything. But it's not nothing. It's something, something important. I think, too, that when we see these passages, we see that prophecy is not necessarily something that must just happen in some kind of spontaneous or even uncontrolled way. These people say, I couldn't help it, I couldn't help it. That's not true. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, my friend. And so often, we can wait on God for this in this gift. And so we can come with that gift already functioning in our lives. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 26 says, How is it, brethren, when you come together, each one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation? Let all things be done for edification. This shows us that we can begin to wait on God in advance and come prepared for what God is, how God's going to use us in a public setting. We mustn't forget that prophecy brings revelation from God. And this revelation can take the veil away. That's what apocalypsis means. It can take the veil away. It can bring a revelation, an unveiling, a revealing of God. And especially, it's the revealing of God's heart, God's mind, and directing that heart and mind to the church of Jesus Christ. It's a now word. It's a new word, showing something fresh from the Father. And it won't necessarily be, as I said before, a a word that is added to the Scripture. It never will be that. But it will be an unveiling, some fresh appreciation of what God has said in some pertinent and relevant way. Now, prophecy must be judged. 
And in the, one of the future sessions, we're going to spend time on this in a great detail on what it means to judge prophecy. But right now, let's just notice that here and now, prophecy must be judged. Prophecy also is for every believer. You all may prophesy one by one, it says in 1 Corinthians. You can all prophesy one by one, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 31. This means that when we move in the Spirit we are, and are open to God, we can all flow in this gift. It must be done decently and in order. The word means with beauty, gracefully, and not in an uncontrolled or unhelpful manner. In order. That means our service should have an order, a deliberate arrangement with proper and appropriate and recognized place for all things. So these people who say, I've got to prophesy, I've got to prophesy now. No, 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 no. Friends, it is to be done decently and in order. And when prophecy is done in a disorderly fashion, it brings the whole prophetic ministry into disrepute. And so we come to see the vital importance of the gift of prophecy in the church of Jesus Christ. And this is one of the whole range of revelation gifts that we must appreciate is very, very important in the move of God and in the gifting of God for the body of Christ. So we see how we move in a prophetic role. We see how we have a prophetic function to play. We also see that God takes people and gives them the prophetic ministry to minister within the body of Christ and also from the body of Christ to the world outside. Then we also see that the manifestation of the Spirit comes into our lives individually, especially when we come together to worship God, that we might build one another up and encourage one another with the word of the Lord and with the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that's the New Testament teaching on the gift of prophecy and the ministry of prophecy. And the next time we come together, I'm going to go a little deeper to share, you a little, share with you a little bit more about the revelation gifts of the Holy Spirit and how they work together that you may learn to listen to God more carefully in your spiritual life. God bless you. Until the next session.